So uh, don't, don't blank or you'll miss it here. There was a man named Jabez who was more honorable than any of his brothers. His mother named him Jabez because his birth had been so painful. He was the one who prayed to the God of Israel. Oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. And God granted his request. Here is the reading. Well, uh, in our sermon series we're in now, Jabez, probably one of the most minor characters we're going to deal with in this entire sermon series. He's a guy we obviously don't know a whole lot about. In fact, he's only mentioned twice in the whole Bible. Once in this passage from 1 Chronicles that I just read for you. And he's also mentioned in one other place earlier in the book of Chronicles. And I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. So keep that in mind. Now Jabez, as many of you know, he kind of had a resurgence in the early 2000s. With a book by Bruce Wilkinson entitled The Prayer of Jabez. And I happened to go on my walk to Emmaus in the spring of 2001. And at that time, this book was all the rave. In fact, uh, the community in Cincinnati where I went on my walk to Emmaus had Jabez as a table name on that walk for the first time ever. So I didn't sit at that table. I was at the table in Nehemiah. But I, I can remember how excited the whole community was when they found out, woo, we got a new table name. And Jabez happened to be that name. Well, I read this book by Bruce Wilkinson, as was nearly required reading back in those days. And I'll be honest with you, the book was okay. It was about asking God to bless me so I can be a blessing to others. I'm going to have to be honest with you, that sort of sounds like the prosperity gospel to me. Although it's not as bad as some of Joel Osteen's heresies, it did push the idea that, look, we'll do something for the Lord as soon as the Lord does something for us. I'm not sure it works that way. So anyways, that's what the book was about. But I do think that Jabez, in this very short passage, does teach us something incredibly important about prayer. Now, spoiler alert, I'm a huge proponent of prayer. I would tell you, you know, you should pray every day. However, I'm not sure that's often enough. I think that prayer is probably the single most important thing a Christian can do. I would rank honest and sincere prayer even above things like scripture reading, your good deeds, worship. I would rank prayer more important to being a healthy functioning Christian than any of those other things. Now, it takes more than prayer to practice your faith effectively, but prayer should be the foundation upon which you build your walk with Jesus. Not worship, not action, not scripture. Prayer needs to be primary. So if prayer is that important, then it's important enough that we should learn about it. Knowing how and why we pray is incredibly important to making faith a vital part of who and what you are. So if you don't take anything else from the sermon this morning, I want you to understand and embrace the vital nature of prayer. Just like a plant will wither and die without water, you, as a Christian, will wither and die without prayer. Now, Jabez obviously thought that. If you read the whole passage from uh, the whole chapter of 1 Chronicles chapter 4, what you'll find out is it is a genealogy. That's a long list of who was whose father and who was whose son. But in this particular place here in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, these two verses we have are a scribe's note. In the ancient world, in the days before copiers and digital documents and all these kind of things, the only way that they had to preserve something was to write it down again to make another copy. And they would have whole colonies and settlements of people who were literate. And their entire job was to take this important scroll and copy it on another scroll. So that when this one wore out, we still have this one. And as soon as they were done, they get another scroll and write it again. That, that's how it would work. That's how they preserved important documents. So these scribes would have been trained and they would know skills like how to make ink, how to prepare scrolls, and they would spend their time writing and writing to preserve these ancient documents. Many, actually all of which, we have in our Bibles. So they would recopy these important documents for preservation. They preserved all important documents this way by writing and rewriting and rewriting them 
to make sure those documents survived. So with that information, I want to read to you two more verses found in Chronicles. This is uh, Chronicles chapter 2, verses 54 and 55. And as I read this passage, I'm going to just say it right up front. As you can see here, I am about to butcher a whole bunch of names, all right? So as I read this, uh, you're just accepting my pronunciation, even though all of them are wrong. I'm just going to tell you that right up front. But we're going to see how awesome Pastor Tim's enunciation is today. So let's see how I'm doing. First Chronicles chapter 2, verses 54 and 55. The descendants of Salma, who were the people of Bethlehem, the Netophathites, Atroth, Beth, Joab, and the other half of the Menachathites, the Zorites, and the family of scribes living at Jabez, the Terathites, Shimeathites, and the Succothites. And all these were Canaanites who descended from Hamath, the father of the family of Rechab. Okay, I read all of that for one phrase. The family of scribes living at Jabez. At Jabez. Here, Jabez is referred to as a place. And not just any place. It is the place where the scribes lived. So this means that whoever Jabez was, he was so important, he was so influential, that he had a region named after him for a place where scribes lived. So children would go to this place uh, to be trained to read and write and how to make ink and all that stuff, and they would grow up to take on the job of scribe. Reading and writing were so sacred, so few people could do it at that time because it was a serious investment of time, effort, and resources to train a child to read and write. So this particular community at Jabez was one such place, a place where children could go to be trained as scribes. And since it was named after Jabez, this strongly suggests that he was a man of considerable influence who worked hard to get this community of scribes off the ground. This means that when one of the later scribes was again recopying the scroll that we know today as First Chronicles, he took a little liberty, made a notation when he gets to Jabez's name. And that's why this editorial comment from someone who knew who Jabez was went ahead and put a scribe's note and what we see today is now incorporated as a part of our sacred scripture. And in doing so, when God inspired this scribe, probably generations after the man Jabez actually lived, when God inspired the scribe to make this notation, the lesson that we end up learning from these two verses is profound. So since it's just two, let me read it to you again. This is 1 Chronicles 4, 9 and 10. Now, now listen to the details the scribe puts in this editorial comment. There was a man named Jabez who was more honorable than any of his brothers. His mother named him Jabez because his birth had been so painful. He was the one who prayed to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. And God granted him his request. Okay, based on this, just your first hearing of this, what does the scribe think of Jabez? I mean, the scribe clearly had tremendous respect for Jabez because he noted that he had more honor than any of his brothers. Now, that could mean a couple things. It could mean the other brothers in his family, but it could also mean he had great honor among the community of scribes that lived in the place that would eventually be known as Jabez. So Jabez, according to this, was clearly known to be a man of great honor. And he was clearly respected by many people, including the scribe who inserted this notation. Now that's great. Just one minor problem. And you can see it right here. Jabez's name means suffering. According to the scribe, his mom gave him that name. My friends... Of all the people that you have in your life, do you have a single other person who is more willing to say good things about you than your mom? Right? She might not necessarily mean all of them, but if anybody's going to say something good about you, it's probably going to be your mom. Yet his mom named him suffering. Do you know how bad this is for this kid? I mean, look at the detail. 
Not only did his mom name him a bad name, but his mom named him. Where is his father? Naming this child should have been his father's prerogative. And to grow up without a fatherly influence, again, we can speculate as to why he wasn't there, but it doesn't really matter. No matter what the reason why, was that his father wasn't there, this being named suffering by his mother would have been a horrible obstacle to overcome. So the kid named suffering grows up in a male-dominated culture with no father. I mean, talk about some stuff going against you here. And as a young man, Jabez did have some serious adversity to overcome, none of it being his fault. So from this less than ideal situation, the scribe editorial note says, he was the one who prayed to the God of Israel. Oh, he was the one who prayed to the God of Israel. Have you ever had that response to somebody when you meet them? People say things like this to me all the time. Oh, you're the one running around with the mask on. Oh, you're the one who drives the beetle. Oh, you're the one who writes for the newspaper. I hear this all the time. You say this when you meet somebody you only know by reputation. That's why you say it. So Jabez's reputation was what? Oh, he was the one who prayed to God in a very specific way. Prayer was this man's reputation. That's what he was known for. He was the one who prayed. So for just a moment, let's forget what he prayed about for just a second. We'll come back to that. Let's give a shout out to Jabez for being the man who had a reputation for being the one who prayed. Do you know what an honor it would be for me to be known as the pastor who prays? What about you? Would you like to be known as the person who prays? A person who prays so diligently. A person who prays so poignantly that the people around know you as the one who prays. Let me state the obvious here and say there are certainly far worse things you could be known for. But Jabez's reputation for praying is about praying for something specific. So here is Jabez's prayer. He says, bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. Now, at first glance, this prayer is honestly pretty unremarkable, isn't it? I mean, do you know how many times this specific prayer has been prayed in the history of our world? Somebody praying, God, please give me more stuff and please keep me safe from trouble and pain. I'm sure God hears this exact prayer probably literally a billion times a day. So the prayer itself is not all that remarkable until... You stop and realize one little detail about this story. My friends, the man named suffering prayed that he would not suffer. Now, why does that matter? Why does his name matter? Because his name, my friends, was the motivation for his prayer. The man named suffering did not want his legacy to be that I'm the guy who suffered. He was not interested in being known for that. He was asking for God to act in direct contrast to what his name meant. The man born with no father, whose mother named him suffering, asked God, God, please don't let me be defined by my circumstances. See, I don't think this is a selfish prayer as it's usually presented. This is a man who did not want to be defined by his past. He wanted to be defined by his future. He wanted to live as though tomorrow was not going to be limited by the past. God, I don't want to be known as the man who suffered. You know what I want to be known as? I want to be known as the man who was blessed. I want to live beyond the potential of my past. I want to live into your future. That was Jabez's prayer. And God granted his request. You want to know how God granted this request? Jabez established a community of scribes. And because of the work of that little community, there is every reason to believe that we have books preserved in our Old Testament that we would not otherwise have if not for Jabez. Without the community of Jabez, copying and recopying, there's, it's good reason to believe that many of the great stories of the Old Testament, stories like Nehemiah and Gideon, who we had sermon series over here, 
sermons that we've had in this current sermon series, these seven characters. It is possible that without Jabez, all of these God-inspired stories could have been lost to history. But because one man refused to be defined by his past, he was able to set up a community of scribes that preserve these stories so that a family of believers can be inspired by what was written thousands of years later in St. Mary's, Ohio in 2019. See, Jabez begs a question. He invites us to ask a very significant question about our prayer lives. What about your past do you not want to be defined by? What failure, what bad choice, what horrible experience do you not want to be defined by today? You see, in order to not be chained to your past, there are two things you must do. First, you're going to have to get over the fact that it happened. The town where these scribes lived was called Jabez. The community of the scribes was named Suffering in honor of a man who refused to be defined by the suffering in his life. He got over it. He went on to be defined by something much greater. He is not known today as the man who suffered. What is his reputation today? He is known as the man who prayed. He prayed so diligently that God answered his request. And right here this morning, we are reading literal words from our sacred Bible that came from a hand of a scribe trained by Jabez himself. Are you willing to choose to not be defined by your past? Do you have the strength to live beyond the reputation the world has assigned to you? Or are you just going to wallow in self-pity and decide all is lost? Because there's something in your past that you just can't get over. You see, a man getting over his past, that is the difference between Jabez being known as the man who suffered or Jabez being known as the man who prayed. That's what it means to get over your past. This scribe made this editorial note only because Jabez lived beyond the meaning of his name. But there's a second part to this. There's a second part to living beyond your past. The second part is, not only are you willing to get over it, but are you willing to pray about it? See, Jabez, whose very name meant suffering, prayed to God, I don't want to suffer anymore. Now, we can interpret that in the obvious way and say that he prayed that because literally nobody likes to suffer. You know, even if it is their name, they don't like it. But that's not a big deal. Everybody prays that prayer. I believe the reason that this editorial comment was made here was about, uh, made here about Jabez was because God allowed Jabez to live beyond his current circumstances. You know, God didn't automatically give Jabez a charmed life. It was because Jabez refused to be defined by his past that he went on to a spectacular future. You see, if Jabez would have decided, look, I'm just going to be pathetic my whole life then there is no good reason to believe that there even would have been a scribe in the first place to make this editorial comment. Because this scroll may not have been written at all if Jabez doesn't live beyond his past. My friends, God is in the business of putting the past in the past. He did it for Jabez and that was long before we had any Jesus to talk about being part of the equation. And that was what God was willing to do for Jabez. And that is what God is willing to do for you today. To put your past in the past. Yes, it is. And it always will be a part of who you are. But whether or not you are defined by your past is entirely up to you. God is willing and able to do for you what he did for Jabez. And that is change what is the most noteworthy thing about you. Today, we're not reading this passage about Jabez because Jabez is known as the guy who suffered. We're reading about him because he's known as the guy who prayed. And the answer to his prayers may very well have led to the preservation of much as what we have in our Old Testament right here this morning. Friends, the first step in living beyond your past is to put your past in its place. And that is behind you. You know, 
you're going to have a very, very difficult time not being defined by your past if you continually define yourself by your past. You have a chance. You have a chance to choose. What is the most noteworthy thing about you? And if you have something from your past that you don't want to be defined by, then you're going to have to avoid defining yourself by whatever that is. You see, if you define yourself based on something terrible, then everybody else is going to define you that way too. That is why praying against your past is so important because that's the only way you're going to be able to live into a future defined by something other than whatever that thing was. So this morning, I want to close the sermon with an invitation. An invitation to all of my fellow believers in Jesus. That's all of you. God has gone to great lengths to put your past in the past. And he has done that so that you could focus on your future. But that's not going to do anything for you. It's not going to help you in any way in your current definition of who you are if you don't stop dragging that thing around. If you don't put that old hurt, that old pain, that old regret, that evil, that reputation, or whatever it is, if you drag that thing with you wherever you go, and that's how you define yourself, and that's the way everyone else is going to define you too. So the first step in moving forward is prayer. My friends, if you don't get any other part of the sermon, I want you to get my last sentence. I'm going to ask you to retain one sentence. Prayer makes the difference. Prayer is the difference between living based on the limitations of your past or living in to the hope of your future. That's what's in front of you. So my friends, may you go forward and be defined by good things. In Jesus' name, amen.